In Rochdale, England, on 31 Toad Lane, there is a lamp. It is a lamp that represents the start of a revolution. You see, in 1843, a group of laborers, weavers, shoemakers, cabinet joiners, they got together to solve a problem. In England at that time, the society was heavily separated into a small minority of the very, very wealthy who controlled virtually everything. They owned the land, they owned the factories, they owned the businesses, and because only landowners could vote, they owned the government too. And then you had everybody else, which basically they lived in poverty. What matters worse, the poor wages that they received oftentimes included company chits, which were vouchers that were only able to be used at the company-owned stores. And now products in these stores were deliberately inflated prices and often very poor quality. So the very act of buying the necessities for your family meant that you were returning the money back to the factory owners. And it was a vicious cycle. And it appeared that there was no chance for solving it. But this group of 28 men had come together, and they had a vision for a more equitable society. And they were going to do it themselves. They came together, and they decided to pool their resources. And for over a year, they scrimped and saved what they could. And they were determined to open their own store. So on December 21st, 1844, they pulled the boards off the windows of their storefront. They lit the lantern in the front window. And they basically announced to the world, we are open for business at 31 Toad Lane. It was not a particularly impressive showing that night. They only had four items in their inventory. It was a collection of butter, sugar, flour, and oatmeal. That was all there was. But they had done it. They were open. And they survived that night, and the next night, and the night after that. And they grew. And eventually, they were able to hire a shopkeeper. And they paid him a fair wage. And farmers brought them produce and received fair pay for it. And women came. And they lent their money management skills because they'd been managing households on virtually no money their entire lives. This was easy. <laughs> and they brought their fierce determination because for the first time in their lives, they had a vote in something that they owned. This was unheard of. And by doing what they did, these people shaped a new future for their families and their communities. The Rochdale New Pioneers were born, and the cooperative movement was born. Now, to be clear, this was not the first time that people had come together for something like this. There had actually been cooperatives that had begun and failed many times. But the Rochdale folks were determined to succeed where others had not. And they set out a series of operating principles. And these principles were going to guide their decisions. And they dealt with things like democracy, autonomy, honesty, equality. And they became the foundation for the modern cooperative movement. And they are the basis for every cooperative operating today. The powerful cooperative story is one that presents members not as passive consumers, but as active citizens improving a community. That's what the Rochdale pioneers really were. They were active citizens working for improvement. What are we going to be? Now, I would like to tell you that I heard that story, and it like lit this passion. And I you know, joined the cooperative movement. And you know, but that's not actually the case. I didn't hear the story for quite a while after that. <laughs> My journey is a little less dramatic, uh, a little less altruistic, actually. Uh, I had a need that was not being met. <laughs> it was the age-old story of what's in it for me. 
You see, in 2006, I had a six-month-old baby, and I had a brand new diagnosis of multiple sclerosis. And I was looking at this baby, and what I had thought was my vision for the future, suddenly, I had no idea. What does the future hold? Was I going to be in a wheelchair at his graduation? Was I going to be there at all? I had no idea. So I did what you do. You research. I guess. And there's, not, there's a lot of unknowns about MS, actually. Uh, but one thing that was sort of a recurring theme was food. The power of food to heal or to hinder, needing more whole food, fewer chemicals. OK, this is something I can do. I can do this for myself. And that was empowering. I didn't have to be passive with this disease, but my food mattered. So I started shopping at our local farmer's market. And I got to know our local farmers. And these people are crazy passionate about the food they're growing. They're choosing heirloom varieties because they taste better. And they're amending and composting to make this perfect soil to grow these nutrient-dense foods. This was living and breathing something that I honestly had only considered when I'd said, well, well, I don't know, what's on sale? And what am I in the mood for for supper tonight? <laughs> so, so this was entirely new. But then sometimes there is no farmer's market going on. Sometimes it's winter. So what do you do? Well, you, you go to a grocery store, right? And now, though, armed with this, this knowledge that I had about food, shopping at a regular grocery store was actually kind of tough. It's kind of kind of depressing, a little frustrating, because there's a lot of marketing and messaging around our food, but there's not a lot of truth and transparency. But, I mean, that's what we got, right? Nothing to do. Well, in 2011, I got a call from a friend of mine, and this friend had actually been uh, running the local farmer's market for the past, like, 13 or so years. A long time. And she had repeating stories of the farmer's market. She had repeating stories of new farmers showing up to the market and they're fresh faced and they're eager and they're, and they're selling their stuff and they do that for the first year and sometimes they'd be there for the next year and then they'd be gone. They couldn't survive. They couldn't make their mortgage and pay their bills and pay their health insurance while growing our food. So when she called that day, she said, I have an idea. And she pulled four of us into the room at the public library, and she said, I think our community and our farmers need a food co-op. What do you think about starting one? To which I replied, what the heck is a food co-op? <laughs> had, had no idea. Fast forward five years of blood, sweat, tears and wading neck deep through the cooperative movement. And my breakthrough moment happened when I realized that we were not starting a grocery store. What we were doing was actually an engine for social justice. Consider this. What if the residents of communities truly owned the economic base and infrastructure of their communities? What if? What if the economy isn't something that just happens to us? What if the economy isn't purely driven by for-profit corporations or Wall Street or our legislators? We don't actually have to imagine because there are communities who are already building cooperative economies. And for the people involved, it really is revolutionary. Springfield, Massachusetts is the third largest city in the state. It is home to multiple colleges, universities, and hospitals. These anchor institutions, on average, spend one and a half billion dollars every year just buying the goods and services they need. And less than 10% of that is from local businesses. So the Wellspring Cooperative has started putting together a network of cooperatives 
and it is providing good jobs to the people in their community, and it is providing vital services to these institutions and the residents. So they've got this network, and for instance, you've got a, a window restoration business. It's women owned, and it's allowing these women to have good jobs with flexible time schedules so they can care for their family, kids, manage schooling. There is a furniture upholstery business which actually largely employs ex-inmates from the nearby prison who have gone through their multi-year apprenticeship program. And now they've got this gateway back into society with not only a good job, but something that they own within a community that they're going to care a lot more about because they're invested. And most recently, they just raised over a million dollars and broke ground on a commercial greenhouse that is going to supply lettuce and greens and herbs to the community, schools, hospitals, restaurants, and yes, the residents. And it's a network of these businesses working together that is keeping that economy strong and vital. And just like in Rochdale, word spreads. 50 miles down the road in Worcester, Massachusetts, they are building about a dozen cooperatives in a network to provide good jobs and valuable training to their local residents. They are fitting resident skills with the needs of the community. They've brought together businesses such as a landscaping company, honey urban farming, a soil remediation company, and with all of this increased activism within the community, new social endeavors have picked up and these movement organizations, they also need support services. So they have come up with cooperative solutions such as translation services, videography, bookkeeping. See how this is rolling? One more example. Jackson, Mississippi, the population there, 48% struggle with poverty. Jackson, cooperative Jackson started just in April of 2017. They haven't even been around a year yet. But they are dedicated to bringing worker-owned cooperatives as a solution to the marginalized residents of their community to help build community wealth and ownership within, within that community. So they've already, just in the course of a year, they have a, an urban farming collective called Freedom Farms. They have a cafe with an outside catering arm. They've built a community center. They've got a business incubator and even a fabrication center for small business manufacturing. This is changing the entire landscape of this community that until now had felt largely forgotten by legislators, by the government, and by the rest of their community. They've taken up power. And when you see things like this where people support the cooperatives, and the cooperatives are supporting the people and supporting the community, and you see how this networking of economy just keeps growing and building, it has a measurable effect on poverty rates, on quality of life, and on social engagement. Cooperatives exist in every sector of our economy, in every state, and nearly every country in the world. Over one billion people worldwide are members of a cooperative. In the United States alone, there are an estimated 30,000 cooperatives. Right now at this minute, there are over 100 food co-ops in some stage of organizing. And that adds to the 200 plus food cooperatives that are already up and running. Right here in this community, we have a food co-op that has been open for less than a year but they have already contributed close to $11,000 back to local charities. And they are supporting 67 local farmers right now with more being added every day. This is just the tip of the iceberg, these examples of what the cooperative movement can do from an economic standpoint. Remember that each one of those examples is owned by the residents of that community. It was developed to fit a community need. The structure for change exists. With all of those cooperatives around the world, the opportunity is there 
we just have to change our mindset about how we contribute to it. We as consumers have to stop being passive about how we consume. Because the money we spend is actually us voting every single day. And if you value democracy and social justice, then by all means, shop those values. Because the foundation of a cooperative is social and economic justice, but it's also food security, it's racial equality, it is so many things to so many people, but the one thing that a cooperative is not, it is not a spectator sport. It takes all of us. And I know that sometimes change is inconvenient. It is inconvenient to change our habits. But sometimes we have to do what's hard in order to do what is right. And as I see it, there are three particular mindsets that we need to change for ourselves. First is that the dominant economy is the only economy. Cooperatives can exist as a parallel economy with the for-profit world. Cooperatives can provide economic stability to a community while protecting jobs from or outsourcing and corporate downsizing. The second is that your money is voting power. Shop your values. We have to start being willing to pay a fair wage for the things that we consume. The for-profit model pretty much determines that if they're going to sell us cheap goods and they are still going to keep shareholders happy by making a profit, then someone somewhere along that production line is being exploited. We have to seriously consider our consuming habits and understand the true value of what we're buying. The cooperative model expands the landscape for what we know is possible. It gives us the opportunity to create valuable social change. It is not enough to uncover injustice and protest it. We, the people, have to take control democratically of our own resources, because when we do, we can support people and the planet. The lantern that was lit at 31 Toad Lane was happened over 170 years ago, but the cooperative values that it stands for are still alive and well today. The Rochdale New Pioneers proved that we have the power to make true change happen, but it has to start with us. Thank you.